will be helping with the uh, registration and then um, with manning um, like the help desk um, at the hotel. So Connie put together a um, sign up sheet. So we don't have to know like which day, what time, but if you're planning on going to the conference and you're willing to help out, if you could just put your name down so that we we can start kind of planning how many people we have. Now we are sharing this with another chapter um, with the Lower Trinity Basin chapter, which is there on the east side of Houston. So they'll be doing the same thing, but if you could give us, you know, some help, we'd really appreciate it. And then as soon as we can get started, we will. And I apologize. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the question was, what's the date of the conference? It's from Thursday, October 20th through the morning of Sunday, October 23rd. And we'll talk a little bit more about it, but we've had it in um, in our newsletter. I think it's on the website. Um, we'll have... Uh, uh, da, 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 da. There's also, there's also the state is um, starting to evaluate field session proposals. So different chapters have been sending in ideas and, and proposals for field sessions. And so they're uh, looking for one or two people from each chapter, each of the local chapters to help evaluate those. So if you're interested, I know Connie, um, Connie signed up. There was an email that uh, came out that they're either going to have a meeting on Friday or next Tuesday, and I haven't seen what day they picked. Um, I don't know if you've seen anything, Connie. Them. No? Okay. So anyway, if you could let me or Connie know if you're interested in helping out with that, I'd appreciate that too. Oh, are we? Okay. Maybe we're ready. Okay, let's see if we're ready. And now I have to remember how to work the thicker again. This is always. Okay. Do I need to check online if they see it? If, uh, okay. Um, so welcome. Call us to order at 910. Um, we have visitors this morning. I recognize. I don't, okay. All right. Can I give us a um, I'm Hannah Beckett. This is my second time at the meeting. Um, very interested in joining the classes coming this fall. Yay. Have any other visitors this morning? Okay. Um, I want to give a shout out to Kyle Purvis. Kyle Purvis is back. Those of you know Kyle, um, we're very happy to see him here this morning. Um, let's see what else. Okay. Um, we have lots of stuff to get through this morning. Um, <laughs> We have Dr. Susan Lee, um, PCBO, who's going to be giving us a presentation on oyster catchers. Um, then we have several announcements towards the end, so we're going to get started. Yes, sir. Oh, for those of you online, if you could please go on mute. Please, please, please. <laughs> Somebody that has kids, you can hear your kids. 
or grandkids? Okay, so our certifications today. Uh, John Bettinger is not here with us this morning. Um, so our two of our last falls interns, Hugo Martinez and Rocky Walkowiak, um, completed their initial certification. So great for them. Um, our recertifications, we have Jim Calvert, Jackie Hicks, Chris Kniper, Andy Smith, Christine Rivers, Mickey Zofilo, Rainbow Johnson, um, Don, I never pronounce your name right, so, and Bob Whitmarsh. So, um, we have we have those folks here. Any of those folks here today? Uh, this Come on, is everybody Make sure. Where do you want them? Okay. <laughs> Come on, Don. Come on. Don't don't break the camera. <laughs> so we're, we're taking a quick picture here. I was there from congratulations, y'all. <laughs> okay, so now our milestones. Uh, Brenda Martin, 250 hours. Jim Nance, 500. Mary Schwartz, 1,000. Wow. And Roy Morgan, 5,000 hours. Way to go, way to go. Um, we have, let's see, Jim's not here. Brenda, I thought I saw your name. Come on, come on. And Mary, come on. And Roy, come on. We could, we could probably pack together because it'll be, it won't be Linda, heavy close. You know, Linda needs to mute. It's like 70 bucks. Oh. Once we get your certificate in, we'll do a, we'll do a. Uh, same one check back to both of us. Wait. Yeah, Harry. That's considered. <clears throat> so why wouldn't we be able to check too? Well, you could if you want to pay $70. And then another 100 for the next. Yeah, you could do one free check for both of us. Right. Let's see, there's four of us in this reservation. Four Congratulations, y'all. Okay. okay. This award has been a long time in coming. I won't go into all the particulars, but we have Dick Schaffhausen, sir. Come on, come on. Hey. Yeah, picture. Yeah. Selfie. A seashell. He didn't get to be there for the picture, Robert. Six, seven. Six, seven. <laughs> six, seven. Three, two, uh, three, two. Okay, I got there. It started at ten. Ten. Nine. 
So for y'all online, we're presenting Dick with his uh, President's Call to Service Award. Really cool looking pen. Look how many hours he had to have. Did get the President's Call to Service Award. So, President's Call to Service Award is um, awarded uh, when you for 4,000 hours. 4,000 um, so through, through the state. And Dick actually hit 4,000 hours. I believe it was last October, September. Some, somewhere last year, and we had a, a hard time getting things through from the state, but finally got it. And Dave has some stuff for folks. I have stuff. Good stuff. All right, first of all, if you have something from 2020 and 21 you have not picked up yet, it's in an envelope. So I'm going to set it down here. You can do it at break time or anytime you want for that. Minute. And this is more. I have this. And there's two columns of names on here. One's in blue. One's in green with about six names. Those are milestone awards. Blues are recertifications for this year. I want you to look at this list and see if you're on it. If you are, cross your name off and pick a pin that has your name on it. When you pick a lightning well from the blue names, they're on this sheet, pick them off. Pick one off for yourself. Why do you think the state chose the lightning well? What's special about the lightning well? It is a state shell of Texas since 1987, but why did they choose it? There's lots of whelks, there's lots of shells. Why did they choose the lightning whelk? Oh, it's a left, what does that mean, left-handed? They have hands? Oh, what it means is, if you hold a whelk, it's got a crown and it's got, a, it's got its eye stalk at the bottom, right? If you hold it so the crown's up, and almost all whelks, they're right-handed shells, meaning you can put your right hand in, curl it right in, nice fit. It doesn't work the other way around. But a lightning whelk is one of the very, very few shells that's left-handed. So it's a whelk, and it's a left-handed whelk. Only your left, -handed. only your left hand can fit in. Who knows? It must have been. It, maybe it was hashed upside down. I don't know. It does. Oh, I don't know. You tell me what you think it means. I'm afraid to answer that. Sinister comes from Latin, and I can't remember the actual Latin word, but it means left. Ah, Sinister Shell. Thank you for that, Chip. That was Chip Sweeter. Okay. Put these over here. Now, I've got a whole bag of stuff here. And I have a little This is what, by the way, this is a state generated. What do they call that a hard service award or whatever that's called? Hard service award. Thank you, Kathy. All right. And they're in a bag. Please cross the list. I'll, I'll, I'll bet you all. There's the bag. There's the pins. There's the list. And I'm going to now get out of Kathy's way. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks for filling in. Okay, let's see. All right, so our volunteer hours, um, 900 and change for the month. Uh, 
little, almost 5,100 year to date, AT61 and 964 year to date, and then there's the adult impact data. Um, so 21,000 total impact through May. I, given all the stuff and going on and still you know, worries about everything, I, I'm glad to see that number, and I know it'll increase over the summer with the different programs that we have going on. So thank you all for for volunteering and, and getting out there and uh, working with the residents around the county. And, and we also have um, Amanda Gabehart, who is um, a recently transferred in member from the Corpus Christi area, um, achieved her Texas Waters Specialist Certification. So we can congratulate Amanda. I don't know if she's on or not, but if you are, congratulations. And Amanda's certificate has been sent to her, so she should have it. Okay, um, Christine, are you on? Yes, ma'am, I sure am. All right. Dr. Sue, are you on? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Hello? She Can you hear me? Um, you're very, very faint. One second. While we are getting the presentation switched out, I'll go ahead and introduce Sue. So our guest today is Dr. Susan Heath. She is the director. Oh, hold on, of we can't we can't hear you guys. Hold on. Um, Sue, can you, Sue, can you try speaking again, please? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? It's, it's very, very faint. One second. I'm sorry, John, what? Okay, hang on just a second. Sue, could you try speaking again, please? Hello. Hello. There you go. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay, do we want to have Sue share her presentation? Sue, can you please try sharing your presentation now? Yep. So, those of you that don't know, uh, Dr. Susan Heath from Gulf Coast Bird Observatory. Um, and I apologize, I don't, um, I don't have all of her particular sitting in front of me, but many of us have worked with Dr. Sue over the years and she's just such a joy to work with. Um, she's had lots of projects in the area and um, we, I for one always enjoy her presentations because I always learn something which is not hard for me because I don't know a whole lot anyway so okay go ahead Dr. Susan okay can you see the slides yes ma'am okay all right so I'm going to talk to you today about one of my favorite subjects oyster catchers oh no not advancing Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, just oyster catchers in general, there's 11 species in the world, and uh, there, that's on the slide how they're <clears throat> distributed. So there's four species in the Americas, which is uh, North, South, Central America, and then there's five species in Australia and New Zealand. 
one species in Europe and one species in Africa. So they are found on coast worldwide, except for in the polar regions, because uh, there's nothing for them to eat in the polar regions, so they can't live there. And uh, then there's some in tropical areas of Africa and Southeast Asia. Two species actually breed inland, uh, not on the coast, and that's Eurasian and, and South Island. And the term or the name oyster catcher was actually coined by Mark Catsby in 1731, and it replaced the previous name for this bird, which was sea pie. And <coughs> sea pie in, in bird lingo, pied, P-I-E-D, means black and white. Uh, so that's where that name came from, sea pie. I actually kind of like that name better than oyster catcher. Uh, but anyway, they didn't ask me when they decided that. So there is one extinct species uh, from the Canary Islands. So oyster catchers are highly territorial and they're monogamous within the breeding season. So um, what that means territorial is that uh, if you know anything about birds, we have, we have things called colonial water birds, which are like black skimmers and royal terns and things like that. And they nest in a big colony with hundreds of birds all nesting together in a group. So those birds are colonial. Oyster catchers are not colonial, they're territorial. So that means that they will not share their territory with other oyster catchers. So they have to stake out their claim and, uh, and claim it as their own. So they don't breed in a big group like skimmers or terns. <clears throat> uh, most, of, most species of oyster catchers are black or brown above and white below. Uh, there are a few species that are all black but they all have bright orange or red bills. And females are larger than males. And the inland species that I talked about, since they can't feed on marine things, uh, they feed on worms and, uh, and things like that. And the Eurasian oyster catcher, I've seen pictures of them nesting, like they nest on people's lawns and mowed grass. It's pretty weird looking. When you uh, see that compared to to where our oyster catchers nest, so our species is the American oyster catcher. The scientific name is Hamantopus palliatus. It is a species of high concern <coughs> uh, from several agencies, and that is that it, I'm going to go over the reasons of why that is throughout the presentation. So our, our species is the most widely distributed of the four oyster catcher species in the Western Hemisphere. And there's five subspecies of Hamantomus palliatus. So uh, the total population of all American oyster catchers is about 43,000 individuals. And uh, our subspecies, which is Hamantopus palliatus palliatus, is about 20,000 individuals. And there's estimated to be about 11,000 in the U.S. So here in Texas, we have about 500. <coughs> and uh, since they don't breed until they're three or four years old, um, a large number of that 500 in Texas is not breeding birds. It's birds that are not old enough to breed yet. So here's the distribution of American oyster catcher and where the five subspecies are. So you can see ours is the one up there on the right, palliatus palliatus, and uh, you can see it's, as I said, it's the most widely distributed of all of the subspecies of American oyster catcher. There is some discussion about whether these subspecies are identified correctly, and some people think that uh, Fraser eye is, is a hybrid between American oyster catchers and black oyster catchers. Um, but I guess somebody, some enterprising person is going to have to do some DNA analysis to really nail that down. So here's the distribution in the U.S. So you can see they go uh, all the way up the Atlantic coast. They, they are actually um, moving a little bit northward. Just in the last few years, there's been uh, a couple of pairs nesting in Maine. And previous to that, there was none in Maine. So they are moving a little bit northward uh, and you can see that there's none on the Atlantic coast of Florida. They're all 
in, in Florida, they're all on the um, the Gulf Coast. And here is the distribution in Texas. There's about an equal number on the upper and central coast. There's not as many on the lower coast, and that's because the habitat changes significantly and the food resource changes and there's not uh, the same kind of food down there that there is on the the upper and central coast but oyster catchers our american oyster catchers can only live in the coastal zone uh, they they have to live in salt water but of course not offshore they can only live in the bays so their diet is pretty varied actually they eat a lot more than just oysters They'll eat pretty much anything that they can find on an oyster reef. And uh, this bird right here has a hermit crab that it managed to pry out of a shell. Um, so you can see their diet's pretty varied. And so in Texas, oyster catchers nest on bay islands and they nest on the ground, uh, most often on, in the in the shell. And their nest is just a scraped out bowl in the shell. The male actually lays down on his belly and he scrapes the shells out with his feet as he turns himself in a circle to make the bowl. Uh, I've actually only seen them doing that once or twice. Uh, I kind of do that in private, I guess. Um, then the, the male will make multiple scrapes and uh, it's called a scrape, <clears throat> the little bowl, bowls that he makes. And then the female will pick the one that she likes the best and she lays one to three eggs. Three, three eggs is a full clutch. Um, most often if they, if they fail, they'll lay three eggs on their first try. And if that nest doesn't make it for some reason, they will try again. Subsequent nests often don't have a full clutch of three eggs. Um, and as they, Get more as they lay have to lay more and more nests. The number of eggs in the nest gets fewer and fewer just because of the, the um, stress on the female to try to lay so many eggs. Um, so both the male and the female incubate, and the eggs hatch in about 28 days. The chicks are precocial, which means they're fully feathered with down and they can walk as soon as they hatch. So here's a, some typical nest sites. You can see it's just on an island. Usually the, the high part of the island in the shell. Sometimes they put their nests in places where I wonder what they're thinking uh, because they get overwashed a lot out in these bays. And there does seem to be a learning curve to nesting the older birds. Uh, some, some of these birds, if I banded them as a chick, then I know exactly how old they are. And so I can tell that the older birds um, seem to do better because they've learned what, the, what they need to do to nest successfully. So uh, if you can see, there's a scrape in the shell. And then here's the three eggs. Uh, they're very camouflaged. They blend in really well with the shell. They're about the same size as a chicken egg, <clears throat> but they're speckled. Most, um, most shorebird eggs are speckled like that. And then here's three chicks that just hatched. You can see they're still part of the eggshell there. The adults will actually um, pick up the eggshells and carry them away from the nest site because they don't want to leave any cues to a predator that there's uh, young birds there. So they carry the shells away so there's no evidence that a, a nest hatched there. So uh, here's how you can tell the difference between an adult bird and a young bird. So the adult bird has an all orange bill and a young bird will have black on its bill for up to about a year. Uh, so that's the bird on the left there. You can see also that the young bird has a light, light um, edging on all of its feathers on its back and its wings. That, uh, that lighter part of the feathers actually wears off and then the young bird uh, looks like the adult without that light edging on there. So they so they don't actually molt <coughs> out those feathers to look like an adult. The feathers just wear, that light part on the feathers just wears off. 
So why are oyster catchers important? Well, they are a keystone species at the top of the marine food web, so they're a pretty good indicator of oyster reef health, and oyster reefs are a critical component of the marine habitat. Uh, they support many, many, many species. And uh, so oyster catchers can serve as a surrogate species for many others because if you have oyster catchers feeding on a reef, that's a, an indication that that reef is healthy and that it's supporting lots of other species. So threats to oyster catchers are, they do have a pretty low population size. Um, for American oyster catchers, 43,000 individuals. That, that could sound like a large number, um, especially if you compare it to something like a whooping crane where there's only 500 or something of them. But uh, most bird populations are measured in the millions of birds. So 43,000 is not, not very many for the entire population of a species. They are confined to the coastal zone, as I said, and they have pretty low reproductive success. Uh, nest hatching success is 30 to 50 percent. And then if the nest hatches, the fledging success of a chick is only 30 to 50 percent. But if they make it to adulthood, then they have a 50 to 90 percent chance of living until the next year. They do have that delayed breeding, um, which I talked about, where they don't breed until they're at least three. Uh, in my experience, most of the birds that I've banded as chicks don't obtain a territory to nest until they're four or five years old. <coughs> they do have a lot of predators. Probably the worst one is the laughing gulls up in the left corner there. Laughing gulls will, will take the eggs, they'll eat the chicks. Um, and the chicks are vulnerable to that until they're at least two weeks old. The other pictures on here are pictures that I captured with uh, game cameras that I put on nests. So um, I, was, I got a lot of pictures of coyotes. Uh, I got this one picture of a possum. I did get the picture of this cat. It actually has an egg in its mouth. Um, that camera captured that cat going to that nest every every night for about a week and then just as the nest was about to hatch that's when the cat took the egg uh, another threat is overwash as i said they nest on these bay islands and our our tides here in texas we have a very low tide range it's only like a foot to a foot and a half but we have what's called wind-driven tides. And when the, our, our predominant wind is from the southeast, and so because of the direction of the coastline, when we get a really strong southeast wind, it blows a lot of water from the Gulf into the bays and makes a high tide, a, a tide that's much higher than what you would get from the lunar tide cycle. So, um, so we get a lot of overwash from that when we get these high tides from, from south winds. So there's a picture on the right there of a, a this is, these two pictures are the same island. Um, picture on the left is when there's a normal tide. And then the picture on the right, you can see the bird sitting on its nest, uh, incubating with the tide coming up because of the wind. And that, that nest did get overwashed. Uh, there is also a problem with starvation if we get really high tides for too long, then the adults can't feed the chicks and they starve to death. And this is what happened to this one. You can see it has a band on its leg. We had already banded it. We don't band them until right before they're going to fledge. So uh, this chick was, was about ready to be able to fly, but it didn't quite make it. Island erosion is a huge problem. Um, this is a picture of an, uh, what used to be an island. Um, a bird successfully nested, a pair of oyster catchers successfully nested on the island that used to be here um, for many years, but now it's eroded away to nothing, basically. And uh, you can see the signs that we put there um, a few you know, years ago when it was still an island to try to keep people off of it during the nesting season. And, uh, and now it has um, eroded to nothing and they can't nest on it anymore. And this, this pair um, pretty much has no place to nest now that's safe. Um, you can see in the background, uh, 
that's that's a mainland and there's a lot of coyotes on there and so um, they're not often successful because coyotes will get their eggs and their chicks um, human disturbance and refuse is also a big problem uh, pe people don't really realize that these birds are nesting because their nest is just on the ground the bird just looks like it's laying on the ground um, people don't realize when they go on these islands that they're disturbing nesting birds and the eggs are camouflaged so you can't see them very well but if you keep an adult bird away from its nest then the laughing gulls can swoop in and get the eggs uh, or the eggs can get too hot or too cold um, oyster catchers in Texas start nesting in January so there is a chance for the eggs to get too cold if the adult is kept off of the nest uh, yeah, oyster catchers, for some reason, have a huge problem with getting their feet and legs tangled in fishing line. Um, every year, I have to try to rescue two, three, four, five birds that have fishing line tangled around a foot. This, this picture is a bird that we caught in West Galveston Bay. Uh, it had this fishing line wrapped so tightly around the leg that it had actually cut into the leg. We got the fishing line off. Um, we let the bird go. And that, that this was in, uh, I think, 2012. Um, this bird's still out there, still breeding. Um, it, it recovered from this wound, but if we hadn't been able to catch it, it would have died because it would it, the leg would have gotten infected and it prob the infection probably would have killed the bird. Either way, it wouldn't have been able to feed pro properly, and, uh, and so it would have died. bunch of them I'm not able to get to and uh, and most of them are gonna die from the fishing line entanglement so <clears throat> we are monitoring them so that we can determine their productivity um, to get those numbers that I showed you before about how successful nests are at hatching and how successful the chicks are at fledging we want to determine those threats to productivity and uh, and determine the significance of human disturbance and so we're collecting data on all on all of that <clears throat> so if you look in that picture in the top right where that arrow is pointing there's a little um, thing on that egg that if you can see it kind of looks like a little smiley face or something that is a chick starting to uh, peck its way out of the egg so that egg is about to hatch and then on the bottom there's three Three chicks on the shelf there, you can see how vulnerable they are when they don't have a place to hide. Uh, they're just out in the open on the shell. They're camouflaged, but they're still very vulnerable to predation. We're putting these color bands on the birds so that we can determine how they move around and um, figure out if they stay territorial all year, uh, <coughs> how long they stay paired with each other, whether they come back to the same nest site and follow the chicks as they move around until they get to be breeding age. So uh, I think this number does not, these numbers don't include this year, this season. I think I've banded 19 chicks this season and five more adults. Uh, but so um, we've banded almost 500 birds, equal number of adults and chicks. These are, uh, when we first started out, these are the color bands that we used. They had two characters, and this bird is R8. You can tell it's R8 and not 8R because the R has an underline underneath it. That indicates that that's the first character of the code. So the code is the same on both legs. Uh, so this bird is just R8. Um, we ran out of those two character codes, and so we had to switch to these three character codes so um, now these are it's in a triangle pattern so this bird would be the one on the left would be u6w so you read the top character first and then the two bottom characters the one on the right is i think u9u um, and the code is on the bands twice so when you're trying to read these bands you have to re remember that so I do appreciate anybody reporting to me a, a banded oyster catcher that they see um, where where they saw it, when they saw it, and what the code is on the bands. So um, I've been doing this since 2011. Uh, this this year is the 12th year. 
So this is um, some data from the previous 11 seasons. So we, we always find the first nest in January or February. When I first started in 2011, we would always find the first nest in February. And then one year, I went out in February to start looking for nests, and I found two pairs already had chicks. Uh, so they had obviously laid their nest in January. So now I have to start. Now I have to go out in January, uh, start in January, and every year um, I find a few a few nests in January. So I'm not sure what what caused that change. Um, there is a documented nest in January from a long time ago. So um, that may not that may not be a huge change. Um, it might just be, and I'm not monitoring every oyster catcher pair in the state. So that might just be a change within the ones that um, that I'm monitoring. Um, but the ones that start early like that in January, or February, always uh, have the best chance of fledging because the tides are really low in the winter because we get north winds that, uh, conversely to the south winds, north winds blow a lot of water out of the bay, so we have a lot of low tides. There's a lot of food. Uh, the other birds haven't started nesting yet, so there's not as many laughing gulls around, and there's not as many people out there to disturb the birds. Uh, we usually find our last nest in June. Um, it's it's June now, and uh, I think I have still five. I'm monitoring about 40 pairs of birds, and I think I have five active nests right now. Um, as I said, I've banded 19 chicks. Um, most of those have have already fledged they can already fly so a lot of pairs have already fledged a chick um this year's turned out to be about an average year and i think our productivity is going to be about 50 percent, which means about half the pair, half the breeding pairs will fledge at least one chick so the last chicks are fledged in july or august and that just really depends on when the last nest is um the percent of nest fledging chicks has ranged from only as low as eight percent in a year up to sixty-two percent. Um, so it's a it's a big range of uh, how many nests are going to fledge chicks, and that is mostly dependent on the weather because that is the thing that changes the most. Um, all all the other factors, predators, human disturbance, all those things, pretty much stay the same every year, but the weather can be quite different. Um, we can have a year with almost no high tides. We can have a year with a lot of high tides. Um, I have had times when uh, a really bad thunderstorm came through with hail and wiped out every nest that was um, was there. Uh, so the, we the weather is quite variable and that's the, the factor that changes the most. So our productivity range uh, has been from 14% of pairs fledging a chick all the way up to 78% of pairs fledging a chick. And uh, what we have found from the banding is that many of the pairs stay on their territory year round, so they will remain territorial year round. Our birds in Texas do not migrate, but the ones on the Atlantic coast do migrate. Um, so it's a we have a different life history for our birds here. Also, the the males. Um, once a male attains a territory, he will rarely move, but the females will often switch mates in the non-breeding season. So if a female, uh, the female will stay with the male throughout the breeding season, but then if she's not happy with how things are going, she will leave uh, and go find, you know, try to get a pair up with a different male. But the males, once they get a territory, they stay on it because it's so difficult for them to obtain a territory. So I have some pairs um, where it's the same male and female that have been together for 10 years. Um, I have some pairs where a female will move around, um, you know, every year or every couple of years. Um, but the because of all the island erosion, the habitat is becoming very limited for these birds. In, uh, and so they're, they seem like they're kind of not switching around as much as they used to. So just some examples of where these birds nest. Um, this is in East Matagorda Bay. These are just really small islands. Um, the, uh, you can see the intercoastal waterway is at the, the top of that, is the water at the um, top of this slide. And this is by Chinkapin, if you know where that is. Uh, 
these this is pictures from 2011 these um, small little these are called fringing reefs um, they have all eroded to the point that there's no oyster catchers nesting in this in this um, spot anymore uh, when I started monitoring there was 10 pairs of birds in East Matagorda Bay and now there's only four because the habitat has become so limited but um, this is the situation where oyster catchers do the best on these small little islands like this. And it's more than 50% of the nests I find in this kind of a situation. So then we have these um, little outcroppings that are, that can be connected to the mainland at low tide. Um, there's not very much of this kind of habitat, so I don't find too many nests in this type of situation, but it's also these nests are, um, this is where I got the picture of the coyote on the nest. So at low tide, or even even when the tide's not low, a coyote can easily swim out to these islands um, and, and see what's out there. Then we have large islands that will support uh, multiple pairs of oyster catchers. And uh, but there's also lots of other birds nesting on these islands. And so that causes a lot of disturbance. Um, so in a year where we have a whole lot of high tides and this, all the small islands get overwashed, then the, the birds on these large islands would do the best. But in a year when we don't have a lot of high tides, the birds on the small islands do better than these ones on the big islands because they don't have as much competition from other species. And there's not as many laughing gulls around. And then I do find some nests every year on the mainland. They almost never succeed because there's just too many predators. This is at Moses Lake up by uh, Texas City. This is where I got the picture of the possum on the nest. So um, here's just a comparison between the different types of habitat. And you can see that those small islands that aren't, aren't connected to the mainland in any way um, have the best productivity. So we do have a stewardship program uh, for these birds to try to help them. Uh, you saw the pictures of the signs that were posting on nesting islands. We did some boat ramp surveys at one time to just gauge people's knowledge of nesting birds. And that wasn't just for oyster catchers, that was for all nesting. I do uh, public education seminars just like this one. Um, I talk to fishing groups and um, birding groups uh, to try to educate them about the birds that are nesting and, and help them understand why they need to stay off of the islands out there during the nesting season. We did, we did do a public service announcement with American Bird Conservancy one year, but it um, turns out that the Houston television market is one of the most expensive in the country. And so we switched to doing internet advertising on, um, on uh, weather apps and tide apps and things like that on, uh, so people would see it on cell phones. I do hope to put out some signs on boat ramps and um, try to do a boat ramp education program at some point in the future. These are the signs we put out. Uh, the one on the left, we put that on big islands. And then <clears throat> the one on the right, I put those on the smaller islands where it's only oyster catchers. Uh, in, in Texas, all these islands are, are public land. And so we can't, uh, we can't say no trespassing. Um, we can only warn people that there's birds nesting there and uh, and you know politely ask them to stay off. The only time we can uh, say no trespassing is if Audubon buys a lease from GLO for a particular island. And there are some islands like that. Uh, and those islands will have a different sign that says no trespassing and people can be prosecuted for going on those islands. But the biggest problem right now is the habitat that's eroding away. And so GCBO is working with a number of different agencies to uh, do some restoration projects. We have one um, to, restore, to restore four small islands in Jones Bay, which is up by Tiki Island. Um, those are slated to be built in the fall of 2023. And uh, Gallison, we're working with Gallison Bay Foundation on that. I have a couple projects with some master naturalists down um, by Port O'Connor, and they are just doing some small scale restoration for some birds down there that they've been monitoring for me. Um, I'm working with Texas Parks and Wildlife as an advisor on um, a few other projects, and of course, the US Fish and Wildlife Services involved with 
with all of those projects. So I just want to acknowledge all my sponsors and partners. Um, I've had a lot of help over the 12 years on this project. I had three three grad students from three different universities working on this project. Um, I have a lot of help from Master Naturalists. <coughs> Excuse me, monitoring the birds uh, in different bays, a lot of volunteer help. And so I just want to acknowledge all them. I've had funding from numerous agencies to keep this going. And uh, I do a blog at once a week during the nesting season on the GCBO website. It's called the Oyster Catcher Diaries. Um, so if you want to follow along with the Oyster Catcher drama, it really pretty much is a soap opera out there. Um, and uh, so you can you can follow along. Nesting season is is kind of wrapping up now, but uh, I'm still doing that that once a week. I'm probably doing it at least through the end of June. And of course, you can go back and read um, the the previous um, entries from this season. And I think it's time for questions. OK, thank you, Sue. Um, you want to do the in the room or you want to take care of the chat first? How would you like to do it, Susan? Oh, it doesn't matter. Is my did I stop sharing? Uh, yes. OK, I think so. OK, good. We can see the chat on the screen. I'm not sure if that's John or if that's you, but. <laughs> uh, Hold on. What What's the life expectancy of oyster catchers? Uh, if they make it to adulthood, then they live about 10 to 15 years. I have some birds still alive out there that I banded as an adult in 2011, so. Uh, I, if I ban them as an adult, I don't know exactly how old they are. I know they're at least three uh, because they're in a breeding situation, but they're probably older than three. So those birds are at least 15 years old, and there's a few of them out there still left around. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll read it. Um, so Lisa Martinez asks, um, one of your... Uh, early photos showed the oyster catchers in a large group on the shore. They're mm -hmm. territorial. So how would one most likely see them individually in pairs or in large groups? Yeah, that's a good question. So I stole that picture from Florida. <laughs> um, so uh, in Texas, you're most likely to see them in pairs, except in the in the non breeding season, which is um, August to January. Um, all of a sudden they become buddies with each other. It's kind of funny because they fight and fight and fight during the breeding season and then all of a sudden their hormone levels drop off and they're all friends again. Um, and they, so they will hang out in groups during the winter or during the non-breeding season. Um, we don't usually get those big, huge groups like that. That picture was from Florida where they have a lot of migratory Birds from the Atlantic coast spend the winter on the west coast of Florida, and so they get these big groups of 100 or more uh, birds. But we don't get that in Texas, so you're you're most likely to see them in a in a pair. Um, you might see some young birds hanging out together on the beach, <clears throat> and then and you know those won't be territorial because they're too young to breed. Okay, and then her next question was. After the eggs hatch, what is the care process for the chicks? So um, both adults uh, care for the chicks. Our oyster catcher is very much a team effort. Um, they both incubate. They both care for the chicks. Uh, they, the male and the female both go get food. The chicks will mostly stay hidden in some vegetation until they're at least two weeks old, and the adults just bring them food. Once they get to be over two weeks old, then... Uh, they're a little bit less susceptible to predation, so they'll come more out in the open and uh, and go with the adults feeding along the shoreline. And uh, the adults will continue to feed them um, even after the bird, even after the young birds can fly. Sometimes the adults will continue to feed them, and they will stay together as a family group for several months after the young birds can fly because. It takes them a while to learn that specialized feeding 
um, method that they have. And so uh, the adults will still care for the chicks for a little while, even after they can fly. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions here in the room? Anybody? I, I, I was looking at your pictures and the nesting stuff could really like killed your eggs to me. Yeah, yeah, they're bigger than killed your eggs, but yeah, it's very similar. Hey, Sue. Mm -hmm. can you, um, Christine. Can you talk, yes, I'm sorry. Can you talk about the um, habitat there at the end of Sportsman Road that was artificially created? Was that part of the remediation program or? Um, that, no, that was um, that breakwater, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department put in that breakwater there. And, uh, and they built some artificial islands behind the breakwater um, to try to build up habitat there. That was a project to um, stop the islands right there from eroding. It wasn't specifically for oyster catchers. It was, um, it was just habitat in general. Um, unfortunately, those little islands that they created are a little bit too low for nesting birds. And uh, I've had some oyster catchers try to nest on them, and they you almost always get overwashed. <clears throat> okay anybody else all right well thank you so much dr susan um we appreciate it and it's very informative thank you guys for having me um and when will um when will we be hearing about the shrike uh Will you be doing the strike uh, tracking this um, fall again? Yeah, we have one more year. This is this will be the last um, winter of that, and uh, we'll be starting to ban the birds in late October, early November. Um, I'll probably do another presentation in the fall about that. I'll, I'll get with Christine or whoever is the right person for that. Um, we just we just sent out an email recently to all the volunteers that had. Uh, Jennifer had mapped all the birds from the last two years, their territories, and we sent that out to everybody so they could see. I still have not received the information from the lab about um, who's a resident and who's a migrant. So once we get that, it'll be a little more interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I'll uh, I'll get back with you guys in the fall about um, soliciting volunteers for that again. Okay, well, thank you very much. We appreciate you joining us presenting. Right. Take care. You too. Okay. I should have printed out my presentation so I knew what the next thing was. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I think it's break, but one second. Rose, do you want to, uh, I think it was um, break and thanking the volunteers who brought snacks this morning, so. Um. I see. So Pat, our intrepid secretary, printed out the slides, which the president did not. Um, Oren, Regina, oh, Mickey did it, okay. Um, Oren, Regina, Brenda, and Larry, and then Pat. So thank you all very much. All right, we're going to take a quick 10-minute break and then get back restart. So go grab some yummy stuff, and uh, we'll start again in a few minutes. Thank you.
Yeah, if um, if you have some pins up here, please stop and get them. I need to mark my name off. I'll post, I, 
would say go ahead and take this. Yeah, he, he ordered the orders extra. Yeah. Okay, who has the sign up for the state meeting? Okay, it was supposed to. It, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We we will we will send it around. We'll try again. If you want to sign up to help, it's right here. Here's a pen, Dick. Here's a pen. Okay, can we um, start to regroup here, please? So, are you are you in the area? Where is yes, I live? actually uh, lived here my whole life. Uh -huh. I live Jackson. Oh, okay. Well, you're close. Yeah, so I was just trying to track it down and figure out if it going anywhere. All right, are we, are we about ready? Come on, let's go, let's go. All right. Maybe. Okay. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about membership and recruiting. And I'll make this quick. Um, so, the board met in March to have a little retreat and talk about different things. Um, 
but we spent a lot of time talking about membership and recruiting and we had just had to cancel our spring class because we didn't have enough people sign up so why are we concerned so one we're having small classes um, or we're having to cancel them where other chapters around us in the area have waiting lists and they have large classes um, and we have an aging demographic in our chapter <laughs> you look around um, a large number of our members are in the 70 to 79 age group um, it's like 60 people and um, there are times where we're finding we don't have enough members to cover events so so we're concerned you know, we're we're here to provide a trained volunteer for but we have to be able to do that and you know granted we've still got covid hanging over our heads and you know we we understand all that okay um and i realize these numbers are small but one of the things that we're seeing, especially in the last two years, and granted that was COVID, but I don't want to just blame COVID, um, we might have people sign up, but we're not having as many people complete the class. So, um, you know, the, the early years we had, you know, some good sized classes, it dropped down, it went back up. You know, maybe this is a cyclical thing. Um, and then here's our here's our age group here. Um, you know, fifty four percent of our members are over the age of seventy. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we 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 want to be better at recruiting and getting people and retaining them. Okay. So it's not just about training, but welcoming people in. You know, consider how you can help mentor somebody. You know, how can you, you know, talk to your friends? Maybe you know, wear your stuff. You know, all that, all those different things. The the easiest thing for us to do is to use word of mouth advertising. Friends, family, somebody that's in the grocery line. Maybe they see you wearing your your shirt or your hat or whatever they go well what is that right? tell them Do we have flyers put some in your truck your car you know oh hey let me share this with you okay Mary do you want to talk about okay so we will be having a fall class Melanie Hollinshead will be training with me. She'll be a co-director, and then eventually we will take over the training. So I'll be handing that off to her. Now, we're looking to start the classes in late August, and I'd like to complete the classes before Thanksgiving. Now, right now, when we've done classes, they drag into the first week in December. And depending on, on when, when the calendar falls, it may even be the second week in December. I'd like to avoid the holidays. So I'm looking to compress the schedule a little bit. Uh, the class is actually this next bullet point is not correct. Yeah. So I'm looking to go back to a daytime in-person class like we previously had done. So the last two classes due to COVID, I've been doing Thursday evening um, virtual classes with weekend field trips. So I'm looking to go back to the same format we had previously, weekday class, have the class in the morning, field trip in the afternoon, so we get it all done in one day. So I'm, I'm looking to go back to that class. So that's not correct. There will not be weekend field trips. And I'm also looking at um, doing the classes on a Tuesday. That way that will free up the class members and new interns to attend Wednesday meetings and also any Wednesday activities like when we do the October field day they'll be able to attend those they also can then attend the uh, the the state meeting 
without it interfering with any of the classes. So uh, it also gives me some built-in makeup days. Um, I would like to try something a little bit different this class where I tap on the entire chapter to help with the field trips. So where I could have two people sign up for to be at a field trip, take attendance, do some other things that alleviates the burden of having the training team do all of it and me do all of it. So that also gives you the opportunity to uh, brush up on some of your training, uh, participate in the field trips also, and get some volunteer time. And it'll be outside. So that would be for just the field trip portion of the, of the class. No, it's just to do, uh, the only thing they would do is attendance, and uh, then that would get reported back to me. And then we do use radios, and uh, it would be to hand out the radios and collect them, and I'd have some instructions on that and a little bit of training on how to do that. But that's it. You know, the instructor would be the instructor from the class, as it's always been. So... I'm looking at making those changes, uh, looking for a little bit more help and engagement from the entire chapter to help with the field trips. And again, uh, I would say that the uh, virtual meetings, which I thought would be a bigger draw to people who work, just really did not pan out like I thought they would. Uh, we ended up, I think, with a class of eight, eight actually completed this last fall. I think it was the same from the time before. And the people who actually were working people, they don't volunteer. They're not active in the chapter. So uh, we did a lot of that because of COVID. And it was a good, it was a good trial. So I don't see any advantage of doing virtual over in person. So I'm going to continue. I'm going to go back unless something happens that forces me to go virtual. I'm going to go back to daytime in person. So what do, what do we need from you besides, besides helping with field trips is talk up the class. Um, I'm working on the schedule. Uh, I'll be, I'm going to try and have that done by the end of the month, and we'll open registration a little earlier. But if you know people who are interested, let them know. It's coming, and what it'll be a daytime class. I know that does kind of restrict who can attend, but again, didn't really see a lot of advantage in that. And uh, we'll be continuing to advertise and share on social media. So, any questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so what, what was being asked is we do all these different things. We reach out to people. We advertise in that. And people, we hand out brochures and people indicate that they're interested, but they never, they never follow through. I can tell you that every name that I get through our website or other that I reach out to before class. I send them messages and that. Now, having the personal touch, I'd be happy to entertain people reaching out to them 
It's not something I'm going to take on, but if you're willing to do that, you can let me know and uh, I'll hook you up with a list and you can call people and talk to them. That's a great idea. That personal touch always helps. So yes, Marty. Um, I, I don't know, John, can you answer that? No, we've looked at that. Um, I do know that, uh, I've talked to Coastal Prairie and they just have a lot more people that show up at their events and express interest and sign up. Um, uh, they don't even have to do active recruiting. And, and so people sign up and they have a waiting list. So. So why our interest level, our demographics are different uh, a little bit and population levels, we did look at that and um, population levels are a little bit different, but they seem to be a little bit more successful at people just following through when they express interest. Mary, can you talk a little bit about the pop-up outreach that One we're second, thinking about second. doing? Hold, hold on just a second, Christine. Um, we did look at population. So the population of Galveston County versus Brazoria County is not that much different. But Fort Bend is very different. And Coastal Prairie covers three counties, not just Fort Bend. And Fort Bend is growing by leaps and bounds. Um, what, what, what we think may be happening is that Galveston does have a lot of, um, I'll say, retired uh, population, whereas Brazoria, we think that it's mainly, I mean, yes, we're all retired and yeah, we live, well, maybe we're not all retired, but there's, there's also a much larger percentage of working people and it's hard to do this and have a full-time job. Um, I'm sorry, Christine, you were saying something? Yes, I was just asking if you could talk about the pop-up outreach that we had considered doing. Um, That's coming. <laughs> no, but I just meant... another slide. Just a minute. Oh, okay. That that's re relevant to this. I do want to. Okay, I'll get to you. I do want to say one other thing. We did library sessions where nobody showed up. Okay, we we we've done that, and people don't even show up to those, and so um, we've just the interest level just doesn't seem to be there. Uh, go ahead, Bill. The cost will be one hundred and fifty dollars. Okay, and the cost—that's to cover our costs. Uh, even when we raised it to one twenty-five, we didn't cover our costs. Um, so we're just looking to cover our costs. That's all. Yes. That's wear your T-shirts, wear your shirts, hats. You know, so you're basically a walking billboard. I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, that, yeah, that's just saying, hey, be the advertisement um, for our chapter. So anyway, we are looking to um, have a fall class. Hopefully, we, we ideally we want a minimum of ten people. So hopefully, we'll get that, and we'll go from there. I will. Yeah, sorry. I will update that. And that was my misunderstanding. Okay. Clicker. Okay, so our volunteer opportunities, um, please go online and look at them. Um, I know we do have, we did have a change. The beach sweep is going to be tomorrow, right? At the fishing pier fishing pier at Quintana and then in July it's going to be on the Thursday what is that like the 7th the 9th okay 7th uh, tomorrow's the 9th yeah so next month it's going to be on the 7th which will be after the 4th there'll be a lot of stuff out there so let's uh, as many of us get out and help with that okay so we have a special recognition 
Jimmy and Luann. Oh, sorry. Kathy. <laughs> oh, we're backing up. Maybe we're backing up. Yes, sir. If there's are any others that may be interested in the uh, apple snail harvest project with David Heineke? Uh, you know, those activities are not on the calendar. David schedules his trips out to Hudson Woods. And just like last Friday, for example, we had one a trip scheduled and then their power went out out there. So we didn't have a way to clean up the kayaks after we got through. So he canceled it. But where I'm heading with this is if you think you may be interested in uh, going on one of those excursions with David, there's a handful of us in here that participate in that. Uh, really need to send him an email to let him know so he can put you on his distribution list or let me know. And I will uh, communicate, uh, give your email address to him so he can include you. But uh, it's a lot of fun kayaking. You get muddy, you get wet get to play with the mosquitoes, smash eggs, and harvest uh, apple snails that are about the size of your fist, or at least the larger adults. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, lots of birds, but uh, Dick and Kathy and Georgia Monorac, uh, probably maybe a couple of others have gone out there. And uh, for some of it, it's a lot of fun. So if you're interested, David Heineke is the contact. And again, I can give you his email address or just let me know and I will ask David to put you on his distribution. Thanks. Thank you. And it, it is, it's a lot of fun. For me, it's a lot of work because I can just barely pull a kayak. But um, anyway, if you have the time, come on out. Okay, now, Jimmy and Luann, come here. Come on, come here. Come on, the two of you. Come on. So we just want to do a little something for you guys. So, so we we just wanted to do a little something to say thank you for you guys organizing the beach sweep and doing so much. I mean, you you got you guys saw, you know, Sue gave a great example of what that work can do and how it helps. So it, we just wanted to say thanks. Well, I've always so. been the white trash girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the things we, every, every time we go out there, we learn something about human nature. And one thing is that humans are not natural, man. <laughs> they are. Oh, Lord. But anyway. Picking up the fishing line is really important. and We see a lot of that and try to recover as much of that as possible. And we know that, as, as Sue mentioned in her presentation, that, that monofilament line is dangerous to birds. So if we can, and we pick up quite a bit of it. It's amazing, especially around the jetty area. And then the plastics, you know, the plastics are, are out there. And as y'all know, so it's, it's kind of a, episodic kind of thing of course right after memorial week and it really got pretty bad out there but uh we're gonna we we scope at the areas out some someone asked me would y'all ever do any other areas well you know we could probably look at some other areas but we could try to focus on that area we actually saw a difference there at the quintana beach uh jetty parking area even one of the the uh, county uh, rangers of uh, uh, Joel, yeah, he said, man, I see a difference here. So it kind of makes you feel good about that. So come on out and have some fun with us. It's it's an easy job. You don't have to think. Speaking of apple snails, 
I, I do some apple snailing at Resolve County Park. And so if anybody, and it is not as um, strenuous as uh, Hudson Woods. Uh, right now there's birds on the uh, rookery, so you don't really want to get out by the islands. I think they're putting in a little ramp so that we can get on the other side of the bridge. Um, but um, if anybody's interested in that, uh, let me know. I'm going to be gone for about six weeks, and I would like to have somebody go out there and paddle around. And basically, you're just knocking down egg sacs. I'm not seeing a lot of apple snails, but I know they're there. So um, if you're interested, let me know. I would I'd suggest you have your own. They do have some out there, but they're a little tippy. Thanks, Dick. Um, okay, we have a new partnership agreement with um, Texas Historical Commission um, with Levi Jordan Plantation. And this is, uh, it's associated with Varner Hogg somehow. Um, so there's going to be opportunities to host tours, assist with archaeology, collections, native plant gardens, etc. Um, and we're going to try to get Faith Castillo from Levi Jordan to come in and give a presentation on what they're trying to do there. But it's supposed to be opening up this June to the public. So um, I believe it's, uh, it's Brazoria. You, you remember where it's located, Orrin? I'm sorry. I should have Sweeney. No? Levi Jordan. It's on 2611. Oh, it is in Brazil. 521. Okay. Past four forks. Okay. Okay, I'm not from here, so I have no idea what you just said, Jim. Five twenty five twenty one and okay. Anyway, we will get we will get more information from Faith. Um, we do have a link. They have a Google sign up for interest, so we'll get that out to you guys. Okay. Um, I I'm excited about this one because I've always had an interest in archaeology. Um, my husband does not share that, so um, I'm excited for this one. Hey, Ruby, 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 are you, here we go. So, I'm wrong. Sports again. We have already started the summer reading programs first program was in West Columbia at one of the really small libraries. They usually consider 50 or 60 participants as marvelous. They had 100, we had 197 in one room. It was now, it was noisy. <laughs> and I don't have the final number, but we had about 300 at the Angleton Library yesterday. Now, our problem is we have lots of participants, but we don't have enough volunteers. With the reptiles, we need a minimum of six. The sea and shore, which will be covered up in July, we need nine. Because we have uh, fishing and fish printing and things that take more people to work with. So I brought clipboards again. I know we got behind on signing up because not having a meeting in May. Getting to panic, people. Uh, John has been working to have us an online sign up available. He's working on some of the kinks out, but it's, it's good. Hey, Ruby. And, we what? have a question online about um, when you're signed up to help at the library. If you need training to do that, and I know the answer, but I thought I would share that so you can let everyone know. 
you don't. <laughs> we have, a, I call them cheat sheets. I have a folder with all the information you need highlighted and everything. And most of this is all the stuff that you already know anyway. And we don't just throw you to the wolves. We actually tell you what to do and show you. We had somebody new come yesterday and we uh, put her with uh, one who'd been there a lot for a day of training. So we're not going to just leave you to do, oh, I'm just to sit here and do what? We really do try our best to help out. And it's lots of fun. I just love seeing the kids' faces and the parents. We have probably about as many adults as children come to these programs. We have people without children come to the children's programs. And so it's, now what I've done is I have four flipboards. And in the back, there is a calendar if you want to need another calendar. It's also online. And I'm going to start one clipboard at this corner. It goes to the back. I'm going to start another one back there that comes forward. I'm going to confuse you, right? Do the same thing over there because I know it takes a lot longer to sign up when you have four pages to do. So that just gives you a little bit more time. Yes. It started already, yes. Reptiles are June, and July will be Sea at Shore. Yeah, they're on the calendar. I have calendars here if you need another one, a paper copy at the back. Got a bunch of calendars. We did discover we made a mistake on it. We have two June 20th on twice. The second one's 21st. Just stick one there. So. How many of you are going to sign up today? Come on, hands up. Yeah. How many? Did everybody get an email with the with sign up genius? Okay, good. There was there was an issue with it going out, but John's got that worked out. So you know, if you signed up there, great. If you didn't sign up and are having a change of heart, please sign up because again, this gets this is advertising for us, right? And and it is fun to see the kids. Sometimes the parents, some of the parents got in the way, but anyway. <laughs> uh, since there are all four different pages, I do put them all together on a master. After you sign up, I'll move your name over where it belongs. Yes, John. Background check. For years, we've been telling prospective people that they could come to our meetings, like Hannah has two times already. And you can also volunteer with us, even though you haven't really become a member yet, which Hannah has also been doing. And we didn't think anything about it. We were glad to have you there, grab you, yes, you come. And in the middle of the night one night, I started thinking we had three new people we told this to who were coming to help with children's programming, background checks. We had not required background checks. So we had a little meeting about it. And yes, we were supposed to have background checks if you're going to work with children. So the, the county actually did the background checks on those three people for us so we could make it volunteer. So I guess now we need to check background checks. Is that what you wanted, John? OK, so, okay. so for those online, the question was regarding having uh, non-chapter members volunteering with us and especially at the library where we have children and getting uh, background checks. So if you're a member, um, the state does background checks once a year. Um, but what Ruby was able to find out is that the library will take care of those for us. So um, Camp Mohawk is going to be next week. 
um, Monday through Thursday. And um, if you if you can help out, contact Mike Mullenweg. Um, I did see a couple empty slots on his spreadsheet that came out yesterday. So um, I believe there's a training class Friday at one. Yeah, at the at uh, at Camp Mohawk. Hey, Kathy. Yes, ma'am. There's a couple of us that haven't received that email from John. Can we distribute that again, just in case, the Sign Up Genius email? Um, I can forward mine, yes. No, no, I can't forward mine. Okay, John will resend it. Mickey didn't get it? Okay. Okay. Um, I will... I have been having a really bad time with my email and stuff from state all of a sudden has started to go to my spam folder. So um, I, I don't know what's going on with email, but anyway, we'll resend it again. Okay. There are two, one's for the reptiles and one's for the shore, sea and shore. Yes, John. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. So John's comment was um, we did have we did have an issue trying to send to the Google group, and so he was having to put everybody's individual email into. So please make sure that your email is updated on your VMS profile. Okay. Or if you've changed emails and don't know how to do it, get get it to one of us and we'll we'll help get that fixed. Okay, let's see if anything else online. Sorry. Um, Angela didn't see it. Okay. All right. And then in the fall, we're still having uh, the Captain Bob event, right, John? The the okay. So, okay, so in the fall, there's a, John, do you want to talk about it or? Here. Is it here in the room or is it online? All right, Captain Bob is a uh, ag agriculture awareness event that we do well, it was postponed during COVID because the schools uh, wouldn't let the students go on field trips. But anyway, uh, it's something that we've been doing for quite a few, quite a number of years here in Brazoria County. It's at the fairgrounds. Um, schools uh, bus their students over. We have multiple learning stations. Everything from um, agriculture. So we'll have a mobile dairy. We'll have the beekeepers will have display swine, beef, poultry, etc. I do water and seafood, so we'll have the stream trailer, and um, and then we also uh, feed the kids. And so we have, at this point, we're looking at a, a two-day event, depending on the number of schools that participate. Uh, so we need folks in the kitchen to help. Uh, build shish kebabs out of uh, sausage and shrimp and other assorted goodies. And then we'll need people to uh, lead student groups around from station to station. So there's something for everyone. S some of it may not be approved volunteer service, but I tend to beg the board or whomever the powers to be to approve it. And I think that's happened in the past. So it is a it is a good opportunity to uh, be involved in the community effort. Pardon? It's held at the fairgrounds. November 10th and 11th. And I'll probably be using the sign up genius to register volunteers so I can break out the 
I'm in charge of getting volunteers. Break out the uh, number of um, volunteers we need for each segment. So if we need 10 people in the kitchen, there'll be kitchen staff. Um, and we've done it so many years that it's, it tends to go very smoothly. If we need group leaders to lead the student groups around, um, that'll be in there as well. And so it'll be that sort of deal. Does that answer questions online, I hope? Thank you, John. Okay, so we, um, back, what was it, maybe in March, Mary? We did that training, was it March? Okay. So in March, Mary Schwartz and uh, Melanie Hollinshead, and um, somehow I tagged along, Anyway, we were helping do a training down at Brazoria National Wildlife Refuge for um, the Coast, Coastal Prairie chapter. And kind of in between sessions, um, folks from the public were coming, walking through, and like, hey, what are you doing? What, what, what are you, what, what's this stuff? What's out here? And so we started sharing, um, we were doing the pond, um, pond life. Um, stuff where we were using the dip nets and scooping stuff up and then looking at what we caught. And we must have had, I don't know, 20, 30 people come through just asking questions. And from that, we had this idea about doing uh, informal outreach, pop-up outreach with some of our partners. Now, this is still in the how would we do it? Where would we do it? Planning stages. But it would be a great opportunity for folks to get volunteer time, get outside, do some interaction with the public in small settings, not huge settings. And it would get more, um, give us more interaction with the public. So, um, we have a committee that's forming to figure out how would we do this, and we don't want it to be super formal, but we have to make sure that all of our partners, like if we decide to do something up at Shadow Creek Ranch, um, you know, is City of Pearland okay with that? Is the Wildlife Refuge okay? Can we do something maybe on the boardwalk over at Sea Center, Texas? Would they be okay with it? So. There's, there's details, there's ideas. I know you guys have ideas too. So Melanie Holland's head is gonna be heading that up. So if you're interested in helping form this, um, let her know, okay? Um, any, wait, sorry, I thought I saw some hands, okay. Um, if you have ideas or are interested, go ahead and uh, let Melanie know, okay? All right, Don, 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 finances. Okay, since we didn't have a formal presentation on this stuff last month because our people are out, unless you wanted me to do that, you know, by somehow by hand, uh, Opening balance beginning of April was uh, twelve thousand ninety one dollars twelve cents. Revenue was pretty much dues and reimbursements for T-shirts. If you want to call it that, in fact, about half of it was a T-shirt reimbursement from our twentieth anniversary T-shirts, of which one I'm wearing now. That's right. So get them while while they're hot. Two people didn't pick them up, so there's some T-shirts back. See Rose about buying a T-shirt, and uh, you get them at cost, by the way. So that some of the money went out initially when we bought the T-shirts was we had to buy them in advance versus you guys paying for them. If you guys pay for them in advance, then we wind up getting into a tax thing. It's kind of weird. Rather than trying to request a tax exempt day, we decided to do it this way. Uh, plus, it also gives us a better idea of my quantity, so how many, what the actual cost is going to be. Uh, expenses were just basically $19, which was, I think, a cake that we bought for one of the recognition things. 
and our ending balance at twelve thousand nine six thirty nine twenty seven. A uh, few of you that have not paid your dues. Thank you very much for those of you that paid today. I appreciate that. Uh, there's one or two others that have not, but uh, so you can get that out. And to me, we like using the Square methodology, uh, direct payment through TDECU if you have an account there, or by check or cash if, if you happen to see me here. I'm always willing to take cash. Uh, our expenses have been pretty low so far this year. They're going to pick up. I can guarantee you that we'll have our insurance. Hello. Uh, we'll have our insurance plan payment due probably within the next couple of months. Plus, we'll have some expenses with the tied up with the state fair and state uh, whatever they call that thing, annual meeting, conference, whatever. Uh, those of you that have, you know are interested in, please sign up as a volunteer. You cheat somewhere. I don't know where it actually went. Oh. Here. It's over here. The sheet is over here. Apparently, it's not being circulated. Uh, so we will actually circulate it for a change. And so get it that way. Those of you that are online, if you want to volunteer during the uh, state conference, uh, please send uh, uh, Kathy, uh, any board member, a no, an email that says you're willing to sign up so we have your name so we can see how many we actually have and will need. Any questions about this stuff? Thanks. Thank you. Um, Rose, there's a comment from Christina H online that her shirt is paid for. She just needs to pick it up. You, yes. Okay. Um, Christina, your shirt is in the office with Crystal. So it's here at the AgriLife office for you to pick up if that helps. Bob, is this appropriate for AT and not? If you send that, send me the information for the whole event. So if it is appropriate, I'll go ahead and send it out to the whole chapter. And that way everybody have an opportunity to get that. And uh, you know, if it, even if it's kind of late, but get it to me as soon as you can so that opportunity for the members to see it as well. Yeah, if it's something that you're interested in, I guarantee you there, there's somebody else that would be interested as well. So, And we're not all on the same mailing lists uh, with the different agencies. So um, share those uh, AT programs when you come across them. OK, so what do we need for state conference? Um, it's going to be October 20th to the 23rd at the Omni Houston. The registration is going to open up August 1st and close September 28th. We do not have the cost yet because the state's still trying to figure that out. Um, they uh, are using, um, they try to make uh, use of as many sponsorships as they can to drop the cost to the register to the attendees. So they hope to have that cost um, figured out by G July, first part of July. Um, we said earlier before the meeting, our assignment is the registration and uh, information desk that we're going to be sharing with um, Trinity Basin chapter. So please, um, if you can take a slot sometime over, the week over that weekend, please sign up to help. And I realize, you know, you want to, we need to see the schedule, obviously. We don't have the schedule yet. So, um, but if, if you're interested in helping, please let us know. Um, Kathy. Rose, I think you to already told Connie you were interested in the field trip selection. And the other thing is um, we're going to, uh, we want to submit uh, Melanie Hollingshead's um, that spider survey um, as a chapter project. So what was it last year? Was it last year, Marty? Um, our chapter one with um, a presentation on the bo boardwalk um, work down at Bobcat Woods. So um, 
if you're willing to help Melanie put something together, um, filming, editing, being an extra, you know, um, that would be helpful. And uh, we can get that in. Hey, Kathy. Oh, that's true. We do. We got, what, $800 last year? Yeah. So, yes, Christine. I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify that for the people signing up for registration and information desks that they would need to be attending the meeting. They have to be registered. It's, so what, what Christine's saying is that you have to be registered to volunteer. And I, um, you know, I, I think that's because you would you would be able to attend the sessions. There's not anybody checking your name, that sort of thing. Um, however, if there is somebody that just you know, wants to help out, you know, maybe we I'll find out from state whether that's a set thing. Okay. Um, and we do have scholarships available. And and we will have uh, like we did last year. We are planning on doing um, some scholarships. I'm sorry. We are okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Last set of items. Um, we'll be for it's that time of year, um, so we will be forming a nomination committee, which Mickey will be heading up. So when she, you know, if she, if you're interested in helping, let her know. Otherwise, if she comes and taps you on the shoulder. Or calls you or put you in a headlock um, please please uh, please help Mary we're doing the name tag still right do you want me to do it okay. so um, Mary Schwartz has offered to since she has a great relationship with our name tag company um, if you need a new name tag let Mary know first replacement will be on us if you, if you need another replacement after that because you lose it or your dog eats it or your grandchild flushes it down the toilet, that one is on you. Okay, so if you need a new name tag, please let Mary know. And Mary will send out an email. And uh, as always, let Lisa Myers know. Uh, if you've got news items, you've got pictures. I know we have a lot of great photographers in this group. Um, so we'll send that stuff in. Yes, Connie. Oh, here. Um, we have a small change in our chapter operating handbook, and we'll be discussing and voting on that change at the next board meeting. And all members are invited to attend the board meeting if they have any comments. I will send out an email with uh, specifying what the changes are. It has to do with um, makeup classes, uh, and we're just specifying that not only do you have to make up the classroom part, you have to make up the field session parts as well. And uh, the state has decreased uh, the amount of time you have to certify as an intern from 15 months to 12 months, so we're making that clarification in our handbook. So we'll we'll be discussing that at our July board meeting and voting on it in our August general meeting. Uh, it'll be brought before the membership if it passes through the board. Thank you. Okay, I believe that is it. So, Mr. Whitmarsh, Kathy, Kathy, yes, Christine. Sorry. We have one person, um, Angela Griffin, would also like to point out that she is accepting pictures and stories for Facebook. And that's um, if you are out and about with your cell phone and you're volunteering, take pictures and you can text them right to her and she can get them on our Facebook immediately. We're trying to really increase our social presence. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um. Yes. The AT hours is three quarters of an hour for AT. I would encourage people to think about things they could do for master for the nature notes. 
So we'd get it up the whole hour for AT if we had a nature notes today, but we didn't. And the meeting is an hour and a quarter. Okay, so the meeting is an hour and a quarter, and the uh, AT is uh, three quarters, 0.75. And I apologize, I was supposed to see, or is there anything anybody wants to bring up? Any questions from the membership? Yes, Ruby. Okay. So, so some of the June library programs don't have enough people signed up yet. So if you can, please. Please go sign up. Um, are you set for this week, Ruby? Where do you need people? Okay, she needs one more person. One more person in Sweeney tomorrow. If you have five, you need. And we need three more people include on Friday. So if if you're in those areas or even if you're not and you're free tomorrow please come help okay all right we are adjourned grab some snacks <laughs>